Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Maker Workroom. I'm Matthew Nagy, and we're about to get stitching. In today's episode of the Modern Maker Workroom, we are going to work through part three of Freyle's Robilla. In part one, we cut the garment out by chalking directly onto the cloth using an original diagram from the 16th century from Freyle's manual, which was published in 1588. In the second episode, I took you through all of the initial steps of creating the garment, from cutting the interlinings and the linings, to basting it together, and finally to having the first basted fitting. In this episode, we'll begin working through all of the final elements. We'll take the information we gathered from that fitting, I'll make some small adjustments to the shoulders, and then the garment will get put together step by step all the way through to the end. At the very end of the video, you can see me standing with the garment completely finished, worn on top of one of my favorite suits. I'm so glad that you've joined me for all of this uh, little journey to create this garment, and I hope that you'll enjoy this episode. Thank you so much, and I look forward to teaching you many, many more garments. Have fun, and now let's get stitching. Now that I've done my final fitting uh, with everything just basted together, I have to take it apart and start working on making the adjustments. So, I have uh, adjusted the shoulder and I'll do my adjustment for how the side back seam is sewn. I'll, I'll go ahead and baste them and stitch them together. So the basting of course just takes the place of pins, although I do use a pin periodically to help hold things in place while I am putting the basting in, but as soon as I've gotten past them I always take the pins out. Now this is just like stitching any other seam. You start with all of your basting and then you use a back stitch for the seam. Now I've specifically closed the side back seam with just a plain seam with a back stitch rather than um, sewing from the outside only because I want this pattern to be usable with both machine sewing and hand sewing. Once I have those side back seams, then I'm going to make sure that I have trimmed out the excess padding from the armhole area. And I trim out about an inch. Moving on, I will start uh, working with the hem here. And my uh, edges were offset a little bit because I had to adjust the position of the side back seam in order to get the balance to be more correct on the jacket. Once I've uh, trued up my hem, then I'll take my hem stiffener, which is just a scrap. It looks like it's cut on the bias. It's not on a full bias. It was just cut from a scrap. But if I can get it on the diagonal, I do because that helps it uh, curve a little bit more easily into the hem. Once I have it in place, then I'll start stitching it. Now I'm using white thread for a very specific reason here, and it's because you're stitching into the canvas. These are... Um, permanent stitches and I really don't want them to go through to the outside. So using a white thread kind of forces me to be extra careful and I'm not going to make any sloppy moves. Um, it just kind of makes me do it right. Once the bottom is stitched in place, then I'm going to carefully cross stitch the top of it. Um, and I'm only going into the canvas here. I'm not going through to the other side, as you can see. The next step uh, to work with the hem is just to press up the bottom and then stitch it in place. And I'm just using a catch stitch here because it's nice and fast. I prefer to use a catch stitch because it holds the edge really nice and flat. A whip stitch tends to create a little bit of a bulge, so I, I stay away from it as I'm working. But this goes really, really quickly and you'll be done in no time. So this may seem a little counterintuitive, but with the garment at the place where it is, with the side back seam sewn and flat, now is the time that I put the lining in. So I stitch up my lining and I'm using a back stitch uh, for the center back seam and then in other places I'll use a running stitch. And uh, I just put the whole thing together, center back and side back seams, and then press them open. And then once that's done, we baste the seam allowances together for the outside and the inside. And what this does is it helps kind of nail the lining in place and it controls how it moves and where it goes. And it makes the exterior and the interior work together as a unit 
versus two separate layers that tend to not necessarily interact well with each other. So to base these seam allowances together, I have removed the neck or the collar area from the lining and that's because the collar is going to be faced with a different piece of fabric. So as the lining goes in, the seam allowances are placed face to face and you can really see me doing it here. And then I just use uh, my regular basting thread and I use small permanent stitches to baste the edges of the seam allowance together. And I only have to do this on one side. Um, but this, these stitches don't go through to the outside. You want to make sure that they don't cross the actual stitching line of the seam. But you can put the seam allowances together and, and just stitch them in place. Now I leave the top and bottom quite loose. So I have about two inches at the top that doesn't have any stitching. And I'll have about four inches at the bottom that doesn't have any stitching. And that just gives me the ability to work with the edges of the garment. Because if I don't, then I'm kind of going to be stuck when it comes to putting other pieces of the garment on. And the same for the side back seam, I will leave the top two into a, to two and a half inches unstitched and then I'll baste all the way down along the seam allowance and then leave the bottom uh, area a little bit open as well. Once those three vertical seams are done, then I'll turn my attention to the center fronts. Now this is the side that doesn't have the buttonholes and it's quite easy because you just turn the seam allowance under and pin it in place. And I usually will pin first to get it in place and then I'll baste it and remove the pins, which then makes all of my actual sewing quite a bit easier. Now, if you recall, I did some manipulation at the center front chest area because of my particular body requirements. I actually cut the jacket slightly differently with a curved center front so that I could create a hollow for my more prominent chest. So that means that the area of the basting right there is going to have a little bit of fullness. I have just added a little bit of puckering right there, which when I stitch it permanently, the stitches will be quite small and I'll kind of nail all of that in place. But this just helps keep the lining sitting the way it needs to sit. So I'll baste around all of the edges first. And in this case, I basted the right front and then I followed up by basting the left front, which is the one with the buttonholes. And then I did the bottom and then I went through and I actually used a pick stitch to stitch all of the lining in around those edges. And the reason I chose a pick stitch for the center fronts and the hem is because the pick stitch tends to squash the lining a little bit more flat and prevents it from rolling a little bit more because the stitches are going through all surface layers. If I just used a stitch along the edge, like a slip stitch or a felling stitch, then only the edge is secured and the lining has a little bit more movement to the interior, which means that there may be more of a tendency for it to roll out of position. So the pick stitch is sort of my saving grace in this aspect and then I can leave a little bit of fullness in the lining so that it doesn't affect the shape of the outside but the edges are really well secured and it looks nice and clean and tidy. This time in the process I know you're really familiar with basting so I'm not going to waste a whole lot of camera time showing you like stitch after stitch after stitch. It's going to be the same no matter what. Now that the basting is done I'm starting to do the pick stitch. Now the pick stitch that I use in this instance is a very small back stitch that's spaced widely apart so that I see little dots of thread but they're not connected in a continuous line the way a normal back stitch would be. With the lining in place you can see this little extra bit of fullness that I have here and that means that the lining will never affect the exterior hang of the garment and that is super important when making a tailored piece of clothing. After the lining is in place, the next step is to close the shoulder. So we match up our notch with the, the collar seam and then we baste the seam in place and then we'll go through and we'll do the back stitch. Now here's the problem. I made an alteration to the shape of the shoulder and I don't know if you can see this here, but I have not actually positioned the shoulder correctly. So I have a bit of a sad moment because I realized that I see my chalk mark here <laughs> and I've made the mistake. So I have to very quickly rip this out and I just do this with a little razor blade and it takes seconds to open up. And once that's done, then I'll just pick the threads out. Um, I don't have to undo the whole seam because the, the collar is correct. It's just the shoulder that's wrong. Then rebaste it in place and then restitch it again, this time making sure that I follow the alteration that I so carefully marked. 
now that it's done, I am happy and it looks good. And you can see that the back is eased in a little bit and the front is stretched and what is a straight edge in the cut pattern now becomes a very curved line and it's going to follow the contours of the body beautifully. In order to get it to press open, I do have to clip the seam allowance here. And when you clip, make sure that you clip all the way to the stitching. Don't get scared and like make it too far away from the stitching. The only way you release all the tension is to clip all the way to the seam. Once that's done, then I stitch these seam allowances down so that they don't affect anything when I start pad stitching the collar. And it's all three vertical seams in the collar, center back and the two side seams of the neck. Here's what the stitching looks like. It's just a whip stitch. It does not go through to the outside. Following that, I take my piece of wool that has been stretched along the top so that I've got some shape to it. Now this is cut on the straight grain. Um, a lot of the surviving garments show that the wool padding is cut on the straight grain and not on the bias as I used to do. Um, but the pad stitching begins and you begin at the outer edge and you start working your way in toward the center. Because it's on the straight grain, there will be some puckering as the, the collar itself starts to taper. And you can see that here, that, that I have too much fabric in the area. So I put slashes into it and then just overlap those slashes and then pad stitch right over the cuts. And it holds everything in place and it actually adds some extra support to the base of the neckline, which helps keep the collar standing the way that it needs to stand. Once all the pad stitching is done, I trim away the excess wool and I trim it from the bottom and I see I'm trimming it above the actual neckline seam. There's no need for this padding to go below this, the neckline seam. Um, I have to finish off my thread here really quickly, but once I'm done with that, then I trim away the excess at the center fronts. On the side that does have the buttonholes, I am keeping it at least an inch and a half to two inches back. So that's almost five centimeters back from the center front edge. And that just allows me room to stitch my final buttonholes in the collar when it's done. So this is almost two inches away there. Once everything is trimmed, I have trimmed a full 2.5 centimeters or an inch away from the edge so that when the half inch or 1.2 centimeter allowance is turned in, it nests into the hollow that's created where the padding is so that you don't end up with this extra bulk at the edge. And what it does is it helps keep the edges nice and thin where typically they could get quite bulky. Now that that's all done, I'm just going to turn this allowance and stitch it in place. And that's really going to help give a lot of security. Before I move on, I wanna make sure that I have secured my uh, shoulder padding in place. Now I'm just basting this from the outside and you can see that I'm holding it over my hand to make sure that I maintain the right shape and that it's not getting pulled out of position. You have to do that basting with the garment held over a curved hand. And what will end up happening later is I'll put the lining in and it will sort of nail all of those pieces in place and I don't have to worry about them. To cut the lining for the collar, here I'm just laying the collar down on top of the straight grain piece of silk that I have that matches my buttonhole facing, and I'm drawing a line around it, and I'll leave a little bit of extra allowance, and this just helps me get the right shape. I will have to contour a little bit with some stretching to get it to fit into all the hollows because the collar itself is a little bit more contoured than a flat piece of silk, but not by much. So I find my centers, I find my height, and then you can see I'm just gonna draw this curved line matching up the points that I've drawn. And it, it really is that simple. You just lay the collar down and, and draw it. Although I do have to say, I found out later that the, the far end from the camera here, I did not cut quite wide enough, and I had to make a couple of small adjustments in order to make that work. And here you see me marking the centers of the silk so that I can just line it up immediately and get right to work stitching it in place. And then I'm just turning the seam allowance under and I'm going to pin in place and then I'm going to baste it and then I'm going to stitch it. And uh, this one I do with the felling stitch because it's right at the edge. There's usually fabrics lying on top of it. So there's not a lot of reason for me to use a pick stitch here. It don't, I don't think it'll serve the same purpose or needs to serve the same purpose as it does around the rest of the lining. 
but it is important that I make sure that the everything is lined up. So as I'm doing this pinning, you can see me also making an effort to curve the collar as I think it's going to lie when it's being worn. And that helps create the right amount of ease and offset in those edges so that when it's being worn, the lining isn't pulling at the collar and making it hang uh, asymmetrically. So here at the top of the buttonholes, I just tuck the buttonhole facing silk kind of underneath the collar and then turn the seam allowance up and then stitch in place. This is where I begin and every garment really that has this kind of setup, that's where I begin. And then it's just a simple felling stitch and I try to keep them small and close together, maybe, you know, maybe a sixteenth of an inch apart slightly wider they, they, they don't need to be microscopic but because this area takes a lot of abrasion from being worn I like to keep more stitches rather than than fewer I just think that it help holds better once all the lining is stitched around the edges then I'll use a cat stitch again not going all the way through to the outside and that secures the bottom edge Once that's in, then I want to start working on closing the lining in. So you'll notice this whole process is very different from a machine sewn garment. And in this case, I will do the back lining first, pulling it up into the neckline and then matching it at the edge of the shoulder, plus a little bit of excess. And I give this little bit of excess specifically because I know that there's going to be bulk. I know that there needs to be extra room in the armhole area. So I just give it a little tiny, it's about a quarter of an inch that hangs off of the edge. And then as I'm pinning it in place, I'm gonna ease the back shoulder down just a little bit as well. You can see that I'm putting some small tucks into the fabric as I go. Once that is in place, then I can, and in this case, I don't think I really did a whole lot in the way of basting, but I am putting my stitches in and I'm leaving the armhole edge free. I have, uh, there's probably about an inch and a half that is unstitched at the armhole edge. And I'm following with my fingers underneath, I can feel where the seam is and I follow that basting along the seam. When I reach the neckline, then I turn and I fell stitch the neckline in place very, very carefully. And then I work my way down the other shoulder. Once that's done, then I pull the front into position and I'll stitch the front onto the back. And you see all these different layers of stitching. Every single thing is controlled. Every single thing is stitched in its own right. And this really helps keep the lining completely secure so that you never have the feeling that the lining is doing something that the exterior isn't. And once all of these are in place, then I just go ahead and uh, stitch them down just as I have everything else with a felling stitch along the neckline and when I uh, close in the extra area around the center fronts that I haven't stitched yet I will switch to using the pick stitch so that it matches the rest of the stitching along the front. So here we are now doing our fell stitching and of course you'll mirror this when you do the second half but they're very small very secure stitches and again I'm making sure not to go all the way through to the outside I am being very careful about that and as I work I'm just snatching my pins out and going. I think I was just in a hurry to finish the garment so I skipped the basting and have just uh, pinned it in place but I'm so used to working like this with modern clothes you can see how quickly I just snatch the pins out and <laughs> throw them onto the magnet. Uh, you know with practice you'll reach you know that level of efficiency as well. But I love putting linings in this way because I feel like I have so much control over every aspect of it. Nothing is left to doubt. Nothing is a surprise. I know exactly what I need to do. I know exactly that everything fits the way it should and is in the exact location where it needs to be. And like a big old dork, I want to show you what the collar looks like. I mean, this collar is really tall, but remember they're supposed to be worn folded down. So let's move on to making the sleeves now. These sleeves are a single seam. They have a single hind seam, but the wrist area does need to be reinforced so that it holds its shape and it can take the buttonholes. So our first step then is to put our interlining into the wrist area and baste it in place. This takes just a couple of minutes. Now I've based the top in place here. These are temporary stitches because I really want to make sure that it's held in place very carefully as I begin to cross stitch the top in place. 
Now this cross stitching is delicate, delicate, delicate. I want to put it through the canvas, but I'm putting it directly into the face of the wool. And I don't want these stitches to be apparent on the outside. So as I'm taking the, the upper portion of the cross stitch, I'm being extra careful to only catch just a couple of the threads on the back side of the fabric so that I don't see any divots on the outside when it's complete. And this is very hard to do. It requires a lot of sensitivity with your uh, needle and thread. So please definitely practice a little bit and don't feel bad if you have to pull it out and do it again. It's completely natural. It is not easy to do. And I learned how to do it 25 years ago. So uh, those of you who are amateurs and learning how to take care of this kind of stitching, just know that it doesn't have to be 100% flawless the first time and you can make it happen. Once that's done, then we just turn the edges in and you could see me earlier, just clip a little bit to know where the top of this interfacing was because that's where the top of the wrist opening will be uh, because there's gonna be buttons and buttonholes. So I turn my corners in, I sort of miter them a little bit, but that's not necessary as long as you have a nice crisp corner and then you finish stitching all around the edge. Once that's done, then we can put the lining in place and you can see that my lining is cut on kind of a strange grain and that had just everything to do with me wanting to conserve my materials when I was cutting the lining out. So I align the lining with the exterior of the fabric and then I just turn under my seam allowance here and again I'll pin it in place and then I will stitch it in place and I will also make a clip to match the placement of the top of the wrist opening so that I know where the vent goes. And once this stitching is done, then I have this really unique way of just turning the sleeve so that I can stitch the outer hind seam and then turning it the other direction so that I stitch the linings hind seam and then I'll baste those seam allowances together. You'll see that coming up here in a minute. So once everything is lined up at the wrist, I'll keep hitting and then I will work my felling stitches. Um, it's felled in place and then we can move on to stitching the hind seam. So once we have everything in position then I will baste the seam up and then we'll start doing the back stitching. Now it's important to remember that the, uh, for the hind seam of a sleeve the outer edge is going to be slightly longer than the inner edge so you see that there's a little bit of easing going on in here and as I do these back stitches I'm using my thumb to push a little bit of that ease into every stitch and this is usually only in the top portion of the hind seam. Now, my apologies for the blasted out white of this, but this is just showing me stitching the hind seam of the lining as well. Um, and then once that's done, then the faces of those seam allowances are pressed open and then put together and basted. And I could not get my computer to darken this enough for it to be really visible. <laughs> so sorry but it's the same process as we did for the center back. Once that's done, then I put a little bar tack at the top of the wrist opening just to make sure that it stays nice and, and secure. Then the lining gets turned inside the shell of the sleeve and the top seam allowances, uh, the edges get basted together and I'm doing this about an eighth of an inch away. Following that, the gathering stitches are put in and I use a nice heavy thread for this. Uh, generally I'll use my, uh, my heavy silk thread for doing that just because it's so nice and strong. Shoulder wings need to happen next and this is just the laws and shape. The pattern actually has it in there. Um, they are, they finish about an inch and a half wide and they are about two thirds of the circumference of the armhole. Once they're stitched up, then I'll baste them into the armhole and I'm matching up the centers with the shoulder seam and just throw a baste in and it keeps it in place until it's actually sewn. For the sleeves, there is a bottom notch and a top notch that um, help me position the sleeve where it belongs. So I'll match the bottom first and then I'll pin all of the area that is not gathered and I'll baste that in place and then the gathered area, I'll just pull the gathering up and make sure that it is nice and even. And it may mean that I have to concentrate it a little bit more in the center, but as long as it looks balanced and even, kind of evenly distributed on either side of the shoulder seam, then the sleeve is going to hang well. 
after the gathering is positioned, then I just keep working my back stitches. And as I do, you can capture a little bit more of that fullness in each stitch and it helps to keep everything nice and even. And it just looks great when it's coming out of the seam on the right side. These stitches be need to be a little bit bigger as well because the area is so thick, trying to use very small stitches could actually be detrimental to the security of the sleeve being in there. Then I clip some of the body seam allowance, but then I just turn the seam allowance toward the body. And that's why we cut so much out of the padding is so that again, just like the collar, the allowance has a little hollow to nest in right next to the padding. So as I'm working, I'm stitching the seam allowance in place, and then when the padding runs out, then I'm just very careful about stitching into the canvas. Once that's done, then we just have to close the armhole in the lining, and that means that we're getting really close to the end of the garment, and that's super exciting. The lining, I just turn my seam allowance under, and I baste it in place, and I usually just do this as I go, rather than trying to pin first and baste second, because everything's been secured in so many places with basting or adjacent seams, there's very little movement in the lining, so I'm not as worried about it getting out of position. I can just turn the seam allowance under and baste. Once that's basted in place, then I'm going to use a pick stitch to stitch it in place. And this isn't 100% necessary. You could use a felling stitch as well. A lot of modern suits use felling stitches in the armhole. There is an extant garment that has a similar shape to this where everything is pick stitched in place. Once the sleeves are in, it is time to do the buttonholes at the wrist. And I just space these a finger width apart and then I know that one finger width is correct for the size of button that I'm using, which is a, a six millimeter wooden bead covered with, um, covered with silk thread. And I'll show you how to make those in a minute. So I'll do the buttonholes on the cuffs and then I'll do the additional buttonholes in the collar. And I'll kind of do them all in one go, much the same way that I did all of the center front buttonholes at the same time. Removing the bastings is 100% my favorite part of making a garment like this because as the basting comes out, you get to really see very clearly the structure of what you've created with all of your careful manipulations and tailoring work. And it, it's a moment where the garment itself really starts to come to life uh, and stand on its own. Instead of being built, you recognize that, oh my gosh, it's done and you've done all of this incredible work. And you can see as I pull it out, you can see a lot of the contours and forms uh, that this, the different planes of fabric are creating. And to me, it's just really exciting because A, it's almost done and B, you just, you've got this sculpture that you've created out of fabric and it's just kind of a cool moment. So there's no great like magic to pulling the basting. There's no order of operations or anything. I just pull them as I come to them. Um, you know, I'm using a blunted awl to catch the thread. It's just a habit I've gotten into. So I'll take all the outside ones out first and then I'll flip it to the inside and then I start removing the inside bastings. So like this one that we did ages ago to hold the front facing in place, we don't need that anymore. We're gonna get rid of it. The same one that we used to hold the lining, we don't need that anymore. We're gonna get rid of it. So every one of these temporary bastings now gets removed. And because we've been so vigilant about pad stitching and basting in place and stitching everything to itself, then it, it uh, all will hold together really nicely. Okay, let's talk about buttons for a second. Teeny tiny little bead. This is a six millimeter diameter wooden bead, very small. And I start with a double strand of silk and you see that I'm trying to lock this into the knot right there. The next stitch that I take, I will treat like a blanket stitch. So I, I, there's a, an extra link that happens in the bottom. And this is important because if you don't do this and you move on to the next step, then the knot will pull out of the center of the bead and then it will be a little bit messy. So I start there and then I go back through the center of the button and I'm just doing a wrapped one. This isn't one that has you know, all the little ribs on it that's sort of a mini acorn style. This is just plain wrapped silk. And it's just so much faster for such a teeny tiny button. As I work, I'm just, I'm just shoving more and more into the button. And 
you know, the center gets really filled up, which is why you see the little pliers standing by, is because at some point it's going to be too hard for me to pull the needle through the center of the, the button. And so I'm going to use the pliers to, to make it happen. But I wrap and wrap and wrap, and I'm very careful to snug one stitch up next to the other. But of course, there's always going to be a little bit that's exposed. Like you can see here how hard it is for me to push that needle through. So I'm just using the pliers to pull, and it's so much easier that way. It just saves my hands, because otherwise they just end up aching by the time I'm done. And this garment has 32 buttons on it, so after you've made that many buttons, let me tell you, your fingers and hands are really tired from working on something this small. Once the whole thing is covered, I'll do a big bullion knot on the top. So you can see me going horizontally across the top of the button, and then I'll take the strand and I'll wrap it six times around the needle. And then once that's wrapped, then I'll pull the needle through and you'll see me gripping the wraps so that they don't go anywhere. And what it does is it creates this little coil that sticks up from the top of the button. And then I take one more stitch and it makes it lie down on the top of the button, creating this little uh, bullion knot that is very indicative of the time period. Most of the buttons that were made in this fashion had this little bullion knot on top and it's um, something that just makes it look really authentic. Now I usually examine the button and if I have any remaining naked areas then I will go under the bullion knot and around the button but I'm not going to go through the core anymore because there's just no room for it. So I will try to fill in all of the extra bits by working my way around and, and just placing threads where they need to be to cover any of the open bits of the wood. Once that's done, I will end up, I'll find my way to the bottom of the bead and I'll take a couple of stitches in one spot and clip it. The next step is to mark the placement of all the buttons. So I just put the center front edges together and I make a little mark right along the edge where every buttonhole is. Now the bead is kind of a free floating little bead and it doesn't have a shank on it and it needs a shank to become a true button. So what I'll do is I will make several passes from the button to the garment so that I create um, like several legs of thread that are, are hanging there. And then once I have about half a dozen, maybe eight uh, passes of thread going between the bead and the garment, then I will wrap the bottom of it up like I'm covering a cord and it becomes a little shank. And the shanks are all, you know, maybe three sixteenths of an inch to a quarter of an inch long and it makes the center fronts lie really nicely. It kind of, the buttons are definitely on the edge of the garment rather than on the top of the garment. Once it's done, then I'll take my needle to the back side and then I'll take a couple of stitches in one place and then I will travel between the layers to the next mark and I'll put the next button on. That means I can usually do three or four buttons per length of, of attachment thread and it just saves time so I'm not tying a knot between every single one. I'm not cutting anything off or going. So here I'm ready to put the next one on now and I'll start again. Here's the finished garment. 32 buttons, countless hours of handwork. You can see that the back fits quite a bit better than it did before. I still have some of those uh, diagonal drag lines that I'm not really excited about, but I think in this case uh, that has also something to do with the size of the breeches I have on underneath. I have lots of freedom of movement. This garment, when it is put on, there's a sensation when you have a garment that is so well made for your body that it just kind of goes thump, and you can feel it on your body and you know that it's contoured perfectly. So this is showing how the collar is folded down and it means that uh, specifically in this time period when the lechuguilla, the figure of eight rough, was a common garment to be worn every day, it gives you something beautiful and comfortable for that to lie on top of. But it also works beautifully well for this style of falling band collar. I don't do a whole lot of ruffs. I have mostly this style of lace edged falling band. That is my pre preference. It's a little bit more 17th century. 
but it doesn't work so well with the collar all the way up. But if you turn it down, it's like magic and it just works beautifully. So I do have this ropia on top of my suit. So I have a doublet underneath, I have breeches underneath, and then this is worn as a jacket. And I've unfastened the top and it drapes open really beautifully. And it just, it's so easy to get into and out of. Yes, there's a lot of buttons to fasten, but when they're made well and the buttonholes are the right size, it's really easy to, to get in and out of the garment. So there you go. That's the end of the Ropia. I think we've just had so much fun making this. I can't believe I got it squashed into three episodes because that's not normal for me. Usually it takes eight or 10 episodes. I'm really happy I can compress everything a little bit more, but it comes off very easily and it's very substantial. Like the weight of it, you can tell it's a really heavily constructed garment and it feels good. And the lining is not moving it's not doing anything it's not supposed to so thank you so much for joining me this has been really wonderful i'm matthew nagy and this is the modern maker